Well, I'm really excited about this project. Um, we actually applied, this took us two shots at applying for this grant, but, um, but I'm, I'm really thrilled. My name is Mary Taglarini. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The whole sanctuary. Um, I actually work out of the Upper Keys office. I've been sleeping on a futon for the last two nights in this office, um, so I can be here with you all today. And um, I've been with the sanctuary for 20 years, one month, and 10 days. So um, I've seen a lot of changes um, over the time. Before that, I taught marine science here in the Keys for about seven years. So I've been here for a little bit. Um, I kind of want to give you just a little bit of an overview. I know that the word NOAA was thrown out there a lot. So I just want to take a couple minutes and, and kind of put you into perspective if you're not real familiar with NOAA and all kind of the different aspects of NOAA. And this is going to be the real quick um, down and dirty of it and stuff. And you get a lot more off websites and all. Let's see if this works. And I am not doing a PowerPoint. I've kind of started a revolt, I'm sorry, <laughs> against PowerPoints. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> you know, I find that people do them and do them, and there are places for them. And, um, okay, so you really want to know the truth? My PowerPoints are on an external hard drive in my office in Key Largo, <laughs> and I only have my laptop, and I went, oh, I forgot to transfer it over. So therefore, I said, what would I have done 10, 15 years ago? I would not have been doing a PowerPoint. So you don't get a PowerPoint from me today. All right, <laughs> so NOAA is located under the Department of Commerce, okay, and this is something a lot of people don't realize. The National Park Service is under the Department of Interior, Interior. okay, um, and we have different enabling legislation, which enabling legislation is what determines what you do. I can't just say, oh, hey, I'm going to start a, a department in the federal government. You have to have enabling legislation in order to do that. The National Park Service works pretty much under the, what's called the Organic Act. The National Wildlife Refuges work under the Migratory Bird Act, Endangered Species Act. National Marine Sanctuaries work under the, real clever, National Marine Sanctuaries Act, okay, from 1972. So why would NOAA be under the Department of Commerce? Anybody got any ideas? Fishing. Fishing, think fishing, think business. Commerce is business. Transportation. How did we used to transport stuff around this country? On boats. On boats. NOAA, even though it was only formed not too many years ago, if you go back to the roots, it's changed its names over the years, has a very old, has a very, is a very old agency, and it comes from transporting things on boats and commerce. That is how we under, ended up under the Department of Commerce. So a lot of people, even with our own, or, our own organization, don't realize that. Okay. So there's a lot of different uh, um, organizations under commerce, the census and stuff like that. But we're going to go down to NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Within NOAA, let me change colors. Oh, I'm not sure what color that one's going to be, orange or black, but we'll see. Okay. Within this, we have, I just have to look at this one, N-E-S-D-I-S, okay. NESDIS. And that is the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. Oh satellites, information. That's kind of your big, you know, what you need to know, okay? So NOAA has satellites out there collecting data, um, and this is what that whole section of NOAA does, okay? Then you have National... Marine Fisheries Service. A lot of people down in the Keys are very familiar with the National Marine Fisheries Service because they make rules. <laughs> and they tell us what we can and cannot do. Okay? So that one a lot of people here know. They not only make rules, okay, but they do a lot of research, a lot of fisheries research and stuff like that. So that's um, a whole nother, another side of NOAA. Okay? Another one that everybody down here is very familiar with is the National Weather Service. Okay, everybody knows about the office over on White Street, on the National Hurricane Center up in Miami. Okay, so the National Weather Service falls under all of this. Okay, you have the OAR, which is the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Okay. Um, again, they are the NOAA research side. So you have some research going in fisheries. You've got um, ocean and atmospheric um, research going on with this group. Okay. Don't I have? Uh, this is kind of the, I shouldn't say, this is kind of the boring group. Okay. Program planning and integration. 
program planning and integration. You have to have strategies. You've got to have all the, the kind of the administrative side of everything. It exists. You can't get away from it. Okay, so that's this group here, PPI. Okay, and that leaves us with the best group under NOAA, which is NOS, which is the National Ocean Service. So, which one do you think National Marine Sanctuaries falls under? <laughs> Hey, NOS, okay, which is the National Ocean Service, um, which really is anything the coastal and the ocean side of everything. Um, so the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was um, developed in 19, uh, 1972. Uh, we have 14 National Marine Sanctuaries. And Todd was so kind to laminate for me this morning. Okay. Right. So we are all around the coast of the United States. We also have um, two sites out in Hawaii, uh, one in American Samoa, and one in the Great Lakes. The first national marine sanctuary was the Monitor. Okay. Mm. Why well, was the Monitor made a national marine sanctuary? Cultural historical. Cultural historical. Sanctuaries can be designated for cultural historical, and or natural resources, okay? So the first one was not a natural resource, but it was actually cultural, historical. Um, the largest one, I just call it Papa because I have a hard time saying the rest of the Papa Hana Makua Kea National Monument, uh, also known as the Northwest um, Hawaiian Islands, okay, is the largest one. Here in the Florida Keys, we have a long history of sanctuaries, okay? This year, is the 20th anniversary. We just had our 20th anniversary in November of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Prior to that, the water adjacent to John Penny Camp Quarry State Park. John Penny Camp Quarry State Park last weekend had their 50th anniversary. Their boundary used to reach out to the 60-foot depth off of Key Largo. But there was this little lawsuit and it went to the Supreme Court with a guy named Mel Fisher mm -hmm. and it wasn't about, it wasn't that lawsuit that changed it. it was, what it did was it brought attention that the state of Florida was claiming waters greater than three miles from shore. They looked at Penny Camp and said, you can't be going out to the 60 foot depth. That's more than three miles from shore. You need to roll your boundary back. Hmm. If you're familiar with the upper reefs, the keys, the reefs in the upper keys, molasses, French, Elbow, Carries Fort, Grecian Rocks, Dry Rocks, all those places would have then not been in a protected area. So they said, well, what are we going to do? So they said, well, let's, there's this new thing called the National Marine Sanctuary Act. Well, let's see if they want to make this a National Marine Sanctuary. 1975, the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary was designated. The manager at Penny Camp kind of spit on, blessed, whatever. Oh, yep, now you're manager of a National Marine Sanctuary, too. And it grew from there. 1981, the Lou Key National Marine Sanctuary, five square nautical miles off of Big Pine, was designated. At that point, there was a thing called a um, evaluation list, SEL, Sanctuary Evaluation List. And if you looked at it, almost every reef along the shoreline in the floor, or along the reef line here in the Florida Keys was on it. You started up, you had Conk and Alligator and Tennessee and Sombrero, American Shoal, and you just went down, Sand Key, all the way down were all on the list to become National Marine Sanctuaries. And you would have had this piecemeal kind of thing. We could have had 15 National Marine Sanctuaries here in the Florida Keys. Water quality was degrading. Okay? We had some other issues. Then in 1989, we had three ship groundings within six weeks. The Mad River Tannic off of the Tortugas and two of them in the Upper Keys, the um, Sleeping on a futon, I lose some brain cells. I'm, I'm, I've gone blank on the name of them, but two of them in the upper keys. Is Wellwood No, Wellwood was 84. This was 1989. It's right there. If I, don't, if I don't think of it, it'll all of a sudden pop out, you know, in a couple sentences down here, and you go, wow, what was that about? <clears throat> it'll come to me. But we had three ship groundings. Ship groundings make national media. Dante Fassell took the opportunity to kind of seize that national media and uh, put forward a proposal to make all of the Florida Keys a national marine sanctuary. So 
that was in October of 1989. November of 1990, the Florida Keys and Ashmean Sanctuary Act was signed. If you know anything about government, that's incredibly <laughs> fast. <laughs> incredibly fast for that to happen. Key Largo and Lou Key became part of the Florida Keys and Ashmean Sanctuary. We had people in Key Largo going, yes, we can go out and go spearfishing now. Those fish are so stupid. They are stupid up there. They haven't been speared since 1960. The hogfish up there, you know, they'll come out and you can, I've actually petted them behind Grecian rocks. They don't know about spear guns. So people were just right. The rules for those two areas remained intact. You did not get to come in and slaughter the hogfish. Okay, there's no spear fishing in those areas. Okay. So 1990, National Sanctuary, the Florida Keys National Sanctuary Act is passed. Um, it tells us we have to write a management plan. We have to have a water quality protection program. Um, big ships are required to stay offshore. Area to be avoided is set up. Ships have to stay out to prevent groundings. Um, and we have to write a management plan. It took us seven years to write a management plan, uh, but we got it done. A lot of public input. July of 1997, the rules and regulations went into effect. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, um, there's zones as to where you can fish, where you can't fish, um, different things like that. But less than 6% of the entire sanctuary is actually a special zone such as that. Most of the area um, is open and people can do it. And that's a little bit different from, you can do what they want, fishing and all. A little bit different from what you would see in a national park. Okay? We are required to manage for conservation, multiple compatible uses. Okay. Remember, we're under the Department of Commerce. Commerce. Okay. We can't put a fence up and say stay out. Okay. Does that mean we never shut down any fishing areas? No, it's not what it says. Okay. But we have to look at how will this impact the, the, uh, the commerce of the area and all. Um, so we have a, <clears throat> we're going to do a tour of the visitor center here. Um, so I'm not going to go into, and a lot of you probably know our resources here, so I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, but I'll be giving you a tour of the visitor center. Uh, this took 10 years to come about. We had a property transfer from the Department of Defense. The first meeting, I was pregnant. My daughter was 10 years old when we did the grand opening of this visitor center. Um, this is my third child, okay? It really is. Um, you know, my kids know it too, you know, but Emily, Craig, and FKEDC. So we have three of them here now. Um, within the sanctuary, uh, we have a number of different programs. Um, uh, the mooring buoys, how many of you go out and, and boat and use our mooring buoys? Okay. So we have installed, we maintain over 400 mooring buoys so that people do not need to drop their anchor out on the reef. And it's a really great way for us to uh, help out the reef and help those resources um, you know, by people using those. So we maintain over 400 of those buoys. That same team maintains all of our marker buoys for our zoned areas. Uh, we have law enforcement through a cooperative partnership with the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission through a memorandum of agreement um, where we give them some money and then their officers enforce our regulations. Uh, education and outreach, I'm the coordinator of that. We have the lovely visitor center here. We do school programs. Uh, you go to a festival or event here in the Keys, and we're probably at it trying to get information out to the boaters, to the people who are using our resources, as to you know, how to be good stewards of the environment, how to use those mooring buoys. Okay? Just because they're there doesn't mean everybody knows how to use them. So we have quite a challenge. We get 4 million visitors here a year in the Keys. Um, trying to get them to know, A, they're in a national marine sanctuary, B, that there's things that they can do to help us out. Let me get my other map. I was remiss. So the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is 2,900 square nautical miles. Uh, basically, if you put your toe in the water in the Florida Keys, you're in a national marine sanctuary. Um, we do extend. Here's Biscayne National Park. Their boundary goes out to the 60-foot depth. So from 60 foot out to the 300 foot depth is actually the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So we do extend all the way up to Miami um, and then all the way out and around the Dry Tortugas. Okay? Uh, Dry Tortugas National Park, Everglades National Park, there's four wildlife refuges within our boundaries. We don't 
um, you know, trump them or anything. We co-manage. We take their regulations and make them part of our regulations um, and things like that. So it's a very cooperative um, program that we have along with the state parks and all of that. But we did grow from 105 square nautical miles to 20, well, it's 2,800 um, with one stroke of a pen. Do you have any affiliation with the we work with a lot of the nonprofits and all stuff. So we do stuff with Reef Relief. Um, the lionfish derbies that you may have all have seen being advertised this fall, we did with Reef um, and stuff. So you know, we while we have staff, um, in my education staff was reduced last year by two. We laid two people off. Okay, financial reasons. Okay, um, so it's really important that we partner with nonprofits. Everglades National Park. You know, we always say the fish don't know <laughs> if they're in Dry Tortugas, Everglades, or the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Okay, our reason for being here. We may have different enabling legislation, but really the reason we're here is the same reason, and it's to protect those resources. Okay. Florida Keys was designated um, not only for the natural resources, our coral reef ecosystem, but also for our shipwrecks. And, and cultural resources. We have more shipwrecks in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary than any other sanctuary. And there's two sanctuaries that were designated just for their shipwrecks. Um, and we still trump them on the number of shipwrecks that we have here. Um, we do support, what's that? Yeah, we do, you know, we rock. We're, we're good here, you know. Well, you should hear them. I mean, you know, it's a moderate, you know, every one of us can always point out all how we're the best and all and stuff. Um, just little things that we do, that we do really well here and all. Um, a couple of the education programs um, that you, you may hear about a little bit. Um, there's one called the Blue Star Program that we've been working on, which is um, dive and snorkel shops have to meet criteria in order to become Blue Star certified. Think of it as the AAA certification for dive and snorkel shops here in the Florida Keys. And uh, so we're, we're getting that ramped up, getting shops on board. Uh, we send secret shoppers out, make sure that, oh yeah, they all say what they're supposed to say when Mary's on board. But are they saying it when somebody else, you know, when one of us isn't there? So we have that program. Down here in QS, we have the Dolphin Smart program, which is for the dolphin viewing um, businesses. Again, they have to meet certain criteria, and then they become dolphin smart. So there's ways that people can, um, you know, help help the environment by by their actions by going with these shops because these are the shops that are really doing um, what they need to be doing. I'm worried that, that the amount of dolphin viewing is actually very harmful. Is that true, or is it uh, well, that well, more of it is how they're doing it. Um, and the number of shops, they actually self-imposed that. They came to us and said, you know, we have a, there was a number of years ago, there was a lot more dolphin viewing businesses here in Key West than there are now. Um, and not everybody was following the Marine, Ma Marine Mammal Act. There's distances that you need to stay back and things like that. So not everybody was doing it. So they had come to us and said, you know, could you guys do something? Change of regulations is difficult, okay? Uh, December 27th, we have a new regulation going into effect, which will be that you are not allowed to dump any effluent into the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and your marine sanitation device must be locked. Um, it took us two and a half years from the first time I came down here for us to sit and start drafting what that would look like. Um, so it's not an easy thing. So trying to come up with a regulation for dolphin watching. And I think that's, that's great about the discharge zone. You know, we, we have to rely on compliance. It, it is. It, mm -hmm. and, and it's an enforcement, and it's an education, and it's a compliance. But at least at this point, we have something that we can go forward with. Wasn't as big a deal down here in Key West because of where your three miles are. Three miles off of Key Largo you know, all the reefs are six, six and a half miles out down here by the time you were, you know, that you were, because the rule was um, you could not dump in state waters. So what boats were doing was just going more than three miles out and dumping. Here they were, you know, you were out past the reef line. I'm not saying it was a good thing, but um, they were out 
in our case, they could go right out to the reef line and basically dump on the reef line um, because they were more than three miles from shore. So um, it is. It's going to be a challenge um, to try to get it, you know, get out there. Um, and then needing the pump out facilities, we've had some good steps forward uh, with some of that and those getting certified. What about all the visible folks into um, the QS? Are they going to start? Because uh, a lot of those, they just switch their, their, their bath when they keep coming. Well, actually, if you'd been at our Sanctuary Advisory Council meeting here yesterday, that was one of the discussions we had, is that it, it, it's a very hard rule to enforce. I was a law enforcement officer for the National Marine Sanctuary for 10 years. I understand enforcement. I understand how hard it is to do. Um, and it is, it's very difficult. Um, you know, you go there and it's locked. There's nothing you can do. They unlock it 10 minutes after you leave. You know, not a whole lot that you can do on that. So, that situation I, it, 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 you know, you can go 100 miles an hour down the stretch, right? And if they're not there, timing you, you get away with it. You know, you get timed, you get caught. It, you know, it, it's all that if they can be there. There was actually uh, a guy that came into uh, Reef Relief's offices a couple weeks ago, and he is starting up a program where he is going to offer free pump outs, mobile free pump outs here in the Keys. Okay. If this program is to go up. Right. Um, upper Keys has, a county runs a pump out boat in the Upper Keys, um, and so, I mean, it's, it's pretty cheap. You can now pump out at John Penn and Camp Quarry State Park for free, Bay Honda State Park for free. Key County Beach has a pump out boat. Marathon has a pump out yeah, boat. There's really no excuse. Why right, right. And, and so the, you know, I don't know, five bucks for 50 gallons, that's an awful lot of yeah. effluent. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of the folks don't even, I mean, aren't even operable. You know, it would have to be something. Yeah, so that's consider. why the pump out boats, right. right. Yeah. And then, right. so this guy's going to do that. That's this right. guy's going to do that. Free mobile pump out. He says he can make more money doing it free than he can if he charges money. So the key is then education, <laughs> outreach, public relations. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a volunteer yeah. program so called. Common yeah. Sense. Yeah. People yeah. should know better. Well, and I'll tell you, when I went to come down, it was a we had like a two day meeting where we had a bunch of staff. You have to write. We had to start writing an environmental. Um, assessment and stuff. Didn't have to do impact assessment, but all for the NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act. You know, we had to do public meetings and all this. So the first day I came down to do this, and I was going to spend the night, and my son, who was six at the time, said, now, Mama, why are you going to Key West? And I thought, oh, he's going to love this as a little boy. I said, and we're going to talk about poop. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Mom. And I said, well, yeah, we're going to talk about poop, and right now you can go dump your poop in the ocean. And both my kids were like, that is so gross. <laughs> and I said, and that's the way you feel, but that's not how everybody feels. When it came up for public comment, my daughter's in seventh grade, she wrote an official letter on public comment. They had just done persuasive writing in school, so it was perfect. And she wrote a letter as to why she really supported this and why it was so horrible that this had not been in place. Um, so if we can get people kind of thinking that way, but it, it's not. So, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. They catch some really gross stuff in the water that usually a little more old. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you look at the beaches in Monroe County, they're closed. Yeah, right. Three yeah. times, three weeks right. out of the month. Yeah, yeah. Due to coliform, you know. Yeah. And it's yeah. terrible. And yeah. It doesn't cause, it doesn't come from chicken runoff. No, it does not come from I, chicken runoff. I thought that the people um, were out there with the cruise ships Right, the cruise oh, ships do get tested. The, the cruise ships are. They're probably the least. They're probably the least. You know, they're going out and they're don't. You know. Um, but don't they? Don't they test the waters right there at Mallory and? Places? They could. I'm not. I'm not real familiar with it. I could be. That's just me not knowing. It's a big. I hate to say it. It's a big sanctuary. I don't know every little thing. So, yes. How about pollutants other than oak? <laughs> Stormwater runoff is a big problem. Mm -hmm. I'm told that the reason the conch don't grow right out here is because there's too much estrogen in the water. And that could be if you listen to um, Rob, Bob Glazer from the uh, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and stuff and all that. Yeah, the near shore, near shore conchs, um, 
their reproductive organs are not developed. If they take those and they move them offshore, um, they actually develop and can reproduce. They move them back in. Well, I don't know if it does that exactly, but yeah, um, and stuff. And so then it looks at it, you know, what exactly is causing that. Um, one of the things that they've looked at is what's in the water and is it from, you know, too much uh, um, estrogen and stuff in the water. So, yeah, I mean, we have a long ways to go. Um, it was real hard for the sanctuary to support putting sewers in in the Keys and still allow people to dump their sewage out in the water. Um, so there's all different angles of it that have to be looked at. Um, one reason the Keys are so special is because of where we sit and we are influenced by three different watersheds. Okay, one of them is what's coming down through the state of Florida, the uh, Kissimmee, Okeechobee, Everglades, the KOE watershed. Okay, another one is what's coming out of the Mississippi River. We all know that we got real lucky this summer with that thing called the loop current, okay, mm -hmm. in that it did not bring any oil here. Okay, I have a lot of other maps that I can show you that shows that loop current coming straight across the Keys. 1993, when the uh, Mississippi River flooded, you could be out in the Tortugas and you could see the difference in the water. We did salinity tests. Okay, really, really fresh water, normal sea water. Sponges were dying off, fish were dying off. So we have, we do get that water. When you were talking about, well, what about if they're in the mountains? Okay. My job as education coordinator is to educate the 4 million people who come here to visit, the 80,000 residents of Monroe County, oh yeah, and 40% of the United States whose water dumps into the Mississippi River because that water comes right past here. Do I bang my head against the door a lot? Yeah. You know, do I, sometimes it's very overwhelming feeling. So a program like this, if we can reach middle America, it's huge. It's very hard to reach people in Iowa and Illinois and Missouri and say, you are connected to the Florida Keys besides going there over spring break. When you're at home, you're connected to us. Our third watershed is the Caribbean that comes up through the Yucatan Peninsula and into the Florida Straits or the Gulf Stream. I've probably gone over my time. But That's you guys great. have had some great questions. Yeah, no.